Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. Uh, today is a special time and, and day uh, because we have the captain, <laughs> the captain, Lee Anderton. How are you from Lan Anderton's Music? How you doing, um, buddy? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and uh, again, apologies to Dave for getting him out of bed so early to do a special European broadcasted uh, Tone Talk. Um, but yes. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to seeing what, what comes up and what questions we get asked. Oh, I am, you know, I have a seven-year-old son. It's not, it's not that early. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm already up. He started school today, so. Really? You're not on, uh, you're not on your summer? To, do you not have the summer vacations? My, my two girls have uh, an eight-week summer vacation uh, where the schools close, and my wife is going crazy trying to find things for them to do every day. Um, yeah, no, we had that. It, it, it's, they get out early June. Okay. And uh, unfortunately they go back uh, <laughs> August. They go back Or early. fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> well, August 14th this year. When I was a kid, it was after- Labor Day. Uh, our Labor Day, which is our holiday here, which is oh. September, what is that? September what? Third, what? I We've always seen like, like like early September, yeah. Yeah, like I would, I would go back as a kid at early September, and I'm like, I think these kids get gypped. <laughs> <laughs> they don't quite have the whole summer. They do. It's true. My son goes back uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I'm really glad to talk to you, Lee, to to have you on the show. Should I do? Do I call you Lee? Do I call you the captain? I'm, no, I'm, please just call me Lee. The, okay. The, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not really sure when it's appropriate to be called the captain, uh, but I think it, it's just yeah. It's my silly nickname that Rob uh, Chapman gave me when we when literally I think the first ever video that we made. So, uh, but yes, Lee is Lee is good. Lee is okay, good. good. No, yeah, I love the ahead. captain's haunted you ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel bad when 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 you know you, you meet somebody from the services and and they'll go so you know you. you uh, What's the background here? And it's like, oh man, it's just so embarrassing. I have no, no military background or anything ever, uh, and I'm embarrassed. But there we go. It's just a silly nickname. It's a silly nickname. That's fun. I mean, you guys, you guys crack me up. I love your videos. Um, been watching your videos for a long time. So uh, you know, to have you on. I mean, you guys are like YouTube legends in a way. I mean, you know, it's great. I mean, it's it's so cool. I'm sure you get stopped when you're at NAM by like tons of people who are like, I see your videos, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. A anywhere where there's anywhere where there's a lot of guitar players, uh, you know, people want to come and say hello, which is awesome. And then very uh, occasionally when I'm in the supermarket and someone will come up and go, oh, you're the captain. And then my, and my <laughs> wife just goes, oh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> Tries to hide in a different aisle whilst I talk to someone about guitars, but yeah, it's, it's that's cool. great. That's <laughs> great. It's very cool. How did you guys I'm, get, go ahead, dude, sorry. I, I'm now experiencing the, uh, in public, all of a sudden someone comes up to me, uh, and it's, it, it gets very weird. I feel like at a concert and from like a hundred yards away, they're yelling, yeah. Hey, it's Dave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, 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 I mean, it's, I guess that's what, you know, YouTube and Facebook and all this kind of social media stuff has done is it's just, if, you know, if you have a hobby, um, you can connect with other people who are into your hobby, no matter where you are around the world. And, uh, and I guess if, you know, if you become, um, you know, if, if, if you're, what you're doing in social media becomes popular, you know, pretty quickly people are recognizing it. I still find it weird. The weirdest thing is that people find it weird to meet me. You know, I just I just sit there going, I, I don't know. It's just it's weird. <laughs> Other people think it's weird to meet me. It's super weird when people think it's weird to meet me in Andertons because it's like, well, where, where did you think I was going to be? <laughs> like every yeah. day, they're like, oh my God, it's the captain. I can't believe you're here. It's like, yeah, I'm. I I'm work here. here. Every I work here. This is my normal job. <laughs> um, but it's all cool. It's all cool. Oh, it's um, great. It's I mean, it's such a great platform to. Be able to obviously you have a product you you have a business right so it helps get get the name out there beyond just the traditional ways of marketing that used to be right I mean has it has it helped business I mean I'm curious about that oh yeah I mean we're fairly well documented that uh, that you know we had 
you know, borderline sort of meteoric rise in sales, um, sort of going alongside the, the, the rise in the number of people who watch the YouTube thing. But funnily enough, that the, the actual um, sales effort has uh, reduced. So, so when I first started YouTube, it was with the sole aim of doing demonstrations to sell products. Mm -hmm. um, and it fairly quickly became apparent that actually that wasn't why people were on YouTube. You know, people were on YouTube to just for entertainment, not for um, to be sold something. And so uh, we relatively quickly um, stepped away from, from um, using it as a platform to just try and sell stuff. And we just said, well, why don't we just have some fun? You know, let, let, you know, we're, you know, we've got this good on-screen chemistry with all the different presenters. They're having fun. It is our hobby. We're talking about uh, what we love. We're talking about different products that we like. We're very honest about what we like and what we don't like. Um, a lot of the time when you're with a presenter, you're also catching up with the guy that you might not have seen him for a month. So again, there's, there's, there's stories that happen and I've done that, you know, so it's really, it's kind of like hijacking just two buddies meeting up and talking about some new gear that they've just seen. Yep. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I don't think, I think people would be shocked at, or maybe they wouldn't, I don't know, but it, it's utterly unrehearsed. Um, quite often I'll choose the products that we're going to video, uh, the day before Rob comes in to do the videos. And quite often the camera is rolling before Rob even knows what products it is that we're going to demo. <laughs> um, and so all of his reactions and opinions are genuinely what anybody would experience the first time they plug right. something in. Um, and I think we're in a really, really fortunate position now that, um, that, that you know, people do, you know, we've got integrity, I think, which maybe, you, you know, it's quite difficult to get. You know, YouTube is full of people that are, being paid to say nice things about products. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know what's believable and what's not. And I've certainly for the last probably three years really had the line of uh, you can't pay to get a product on Anderton's TV. We are just going to talk about stuff that we think is interesting. Um, and whilst out of respect to brands, you know, that all employ people that are all trying to make a living. I've never really felt it was my place to to do a demo of a product that I really didn't like, you know, as in sort of go. Uh, but certainly I think where there's a product where, you know, you kind of like some bits about it, but you don't like other bits about it, or one presenter digs it, but the other presenter doesn't really dig it. Um, that, that I think is cool content to put out there. You know, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. And it's very believable because it is, you know, all largely unrehearsed and true so there we go uh, yeah. But yeah it's it's good fun it's it's really really uh some of my closest friends are people i've met now through you know making videos and youtube so i have a lot to be uh, grateful for yeah i mean it's it's uh, i mean like you said the videos span a whole host of things now i mean you guys are doing you know, budget things. How do you get the sound for this budget thing? How do you get it? If it's not, you know, within a budget, you know, bust the bank kind of thing. You guys also have interviews. You're doing interviews now. It's really expanded into a whole thing. How, how much time does it take each week or, you know, of your day to, to do these well, videos? The, so the video thing is full. There's three full time guys that just that's they are employed to just uh, create uh, video content. So we, we put a piece of content out every day, sometimes twice a day, covering the, so the main channel that people will be familiar with is the guitar centric one. Mm -hmm. There are two smaller channels, one that does drum content, and one that does music technology content, same kind of vibe and format. Um, and me personally, it's probably maybe four or five days a month. Uh, yeah, four, probably four, four days a month. Um, but then I'm only in maybe a third of the, the videos that go up. So, um, oh, wow. I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm one of the anchor men, but not, not, you know, I'm not in everything. And I think that was really important for me about two or three years ago was to go, um, 
it is going to get boring and it is only ever going to appeal to a you know a certain segment if it's the same two guys on it all the time and i really wanted to i really wanted to develop the channel into something more like a tv station rather than a youtube channel where where in, where people could just hit the hit the youtube thing have a look at the last four or five videos that have gone up and gone oh yeah he's the i like that guy or there's something that's here i'll watch that one rather than feeling like you know you got to watch every single video that we put out mm -hmm. um so it's cool you know I mean, we've got some cool plans always you know always for us the, the plan is you know what's next what, what what can what how can we reinvent ourselves every year or two just to, to keep it fresh and mm -hmm. and interesting so um yeah it's all good fun it's 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 all good fun i think it's a really smart business model um because <laughs> it I, I think other music stores could learn from it at least ones that are and, and you know you know i've always said to that as well is uh, we uh we never started it as a business model uh it was always something that i was going to do for a bit of fun and honestly it took probably three years before you could honestly see any tangible commercial benefit to doing it mm -hmm. so i always say to anyone that's going to start trying to do youtube stuff absolutely do it for love because chances are, unless you're incredibly lucky, like we've been, and you happen to, you know, float, you know, up to the point where you know you're one of the larger channels out there. Ninety-nine percent of people who start this will never get past, you know, five hundred subscribers and a few people watching the videos. So a hundred percent do it because you love it. Because then it doesn't matter uh, how many people are watching it or anything like that. Because you're having fun doing it. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and always and don't copy. You know, don't imitate, innovate, because it, it's that sad. Not sadly, it's the wrong thing. I suppose it's flattery, really. There are a lot of people now when you get that that are just trying to do the the Captain and Chappers thing, and it's a bit like, come on, guys, just like find your own thing, mm -hmm. do your own do your own angle. It, it's not because I not because I'm worried that someone's going to come along and do it better than we are. I'm I'm sure sooner you know sooner or later someone will, but just because. I, I just think, you know, the real, you know, it's that that I suppose is a bit like a business model. You know, if you're just going to come along and just do the same as what's already been done, it's just it's just not very interesting, is it? I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got a uh, hundred people watching right now. Yeah, and there's there's looks right. like there's loads of good questions going on as well. So that's cool. Thank you everybody who's uh, who's tuned in from uh, Europe. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, I'm gonna say hi to some folks if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, fire away. Um, I don't know, Dave. Have you uh, already checked the questions? If there were questions, uh, you know what? I haven't looked at any of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Not yet. Uh, Sorry. We got Ben Coombs, who's first in. How's it going, buddy? First thumbs up too. He said. I, um, and uh, the Imbarati. He says a tone talk at a sensible time for Europe. Very cool. Um, the question is: Will there be whiskey involved uh, mm -hmm. from letters? And I think. Lee brought some whiskey. Lee's got it covered. It's a little later for Lee. What what, is, what do I, what do people actually see? Do they see the the thing the same thing I'm seeing? So they see the two little pictures of the people who aren't talking and the big picture of the guy who is. Yes, correct. Yeah. So, so you it, can see. So if I talk and hold the whiskey up at the same time, you see the whiskey. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Plus, I also have the control. I can just pinpoint it on you if I want it to. So. Cool. Um, but yeah. So Dal Dalwinnie, is that a favorite of yours? Uh, this one, uh, another uh, another upside of being a minor YouTube celebrity is uh, somebody sent me this as a thank you for doing the videos, and I've not opened it yet, so I couldn't tell you. But I'm uh, I'm going to upset a lot of single malt fans out there by saying uh, I do prefer a, a blend to a single malt. So I, I, I'm a I'm a Johnny I'm a Johnny Walker kind of guy rather than a uh, a single malt guy. So there we are. Sorry, whiskey lovers of the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, you like the single malt, right? I like single malt. Yes, yes, that's what's a good. Your, what's your favorite? What is your favorite single malt? Uh, probably uh, Balvini. Okay. Uh, I think Twelve year. That's the one, Mark. Yeah, that's the. That's the um, one. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's, not, it's not crazy priced, and it's <laughs> great. <laughs> 
you know. I see e e bar has said it's heresy that I don't like the single or I prefer. The yes, I, yeah, of course. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Right. I, I was kind of thinking the same yeah, thing. He's probably right. He's probably right. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah, you know, some of the stuff you were saying um, about doing it for the love of it, I think, yeah, I think we, we can ring true with this show also. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or you're surely not making any money off this. <laughs> and, you, you we sit, must, and we sit here for three or four hours. <laughs> you, you must, uh, in a, in a, on a serious note, that there's probably a string to that with regards to trying to build amps, isn't there, as well? You know, at, at the beginning, you, you've presumably got no uh, real idea as to how successful something's going to be. So it's surely got to be important that uh, there's an element of love for what you do because let's be honest with you, in our industry, you know, only the very top one or two percent are lucky enough to actually end up making a good living out of this. The rest are just doing it probably as a hobby that that, that they love doing. Correct, correct. It all starts off as a hobby mm. and then spirals out of control, maybe. <laughs> if, you're, if you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, yes. Yeah. Or, or spirals down the toilet, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what I say is, it ha what's the fastest way to make... Uh, Fifty thousand dollars. It's uh, start with a hundred thousand and open a music store. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, now the now now no. When when did you realize? How, how did you start? Actually, that's a good 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 way to. Uh, how did Anderton start? How did your life start? Well, I um, yeah, I was very fortunate in that my uh, my father and my grandfather had done all the hard work. So uh, by the time uh, growing up, they had a little store in Guildford that they opened in 1964. Um, and so by the time I was maybe 13 or 14 years old, uh, the store had uh, maybe half a dozen employees already. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to join as like a, you know, a, a weekend staff member and work in the summer holidays. And uh, and this is this is going to sort of the mid to late eighties. Um, That's great. Uh, and and I and I I just got the bug, you know. I mean, it was just like I learned to play guitar because I thought the store was cool and I liked the vibe in there. And again, it's the music. Your average music, the industry has changed so much. You know, back then it was just a cottage industry. You know, like the uh, that you had a tiny number of customers, relatively speaking. They were all. They were all probably either making a living or supplementing their income through playing guitar. So nobody really had loads of money. And it was, you know, it was just it was a real sense of kind of community vibe. And I, and I was really drawn to that and, and loved it very much. As a result of that, I uh, really, I, I really kind of, you know, much to the dismay of my father, decided that education just wasn't for me and and somehow i wanted to, to sort of just be part of this music store so i i really didn't leave school uh with much in the way of qualifications which i guess uh i wouldn't recommend other you know young people doing um but just a lot of things when you, you know I've, I've got to be honest with you the the that entrepreneurial bit that I think is needed to start a new business and those sleepless nights where everything's on the line and you know you, you've, you've got that sick feeling in your stomach if things aren't going great I was super lucky to, to, to really not experience uh, a lot of that in my time as yeah. I said my, my dad had kind of done the the, the the probably the hardest part just getting it off the ground and then I when I joined I think two or three things happened which really uh, enabled me to be successful. And the, the first one was that I think round about the early 90s, the industry started to change and uh, playing music and guitar specifically became much more of a leisure pursuit for, for people that didn't necessarily want to be a full time guitar player. They just wanted to do, do it for fun. And so the emergence of this kind of uh, this leisure pursuit customer came out and and that customer really um, didn't wasn't really connecting with the sort of the, the the old fashioned Aladdin's cave kind of music store you know that customer was much more used to shopping you know in more conventional retail stores for their clothes or their hi-fi or their TV or whatever and I was 
I guess I was probably part of that. You know, I was more the guitar player who was playing for fun than the guitar player wanted to make a living out of it. And so I think I embraced that quite quickly and I was able to sort of adapt and change the way we retailed products to connect with those customers. So we, we grew fairly quickly in that first sort of 10 years or so that I was there from, from a really small, like provincial town music store to, to quite a decent sized business with, you know, 20 staff or whatever. And then, and then around about 2000, I guess, early 2000s, the internet came along mm. and people of my generation, you know, bearing in mind that I was, uh, you know, in my late twenties by then, we were just really into the internet as a thing. Mm. And so many other music store owners, you know, the guy, people like my dad and, and, and guys who were perhaps in their forties or their fifties, they just thought the internet was going to be a novelty and, 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 uh, and they just assumed or hoped it would go away and they would carry on retailing as they had done for the last 25 years and onwards and upwards. So I guess, you know, we embraced the internet fairly quickly. And again, we had another fairly significant growth spurt off the back of just selling online. And then in 2009, uh, YouTube came along and, you know, that that's when Anderton's has gone from being you know, a, a music store that was fairly well known locally to a store that now is known everywhere, uh, which is insane. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't really, I can't really thank my dad enough for, you know, doing the really hard bit of getting it started and then having the confidence and the, the to, to sort of give me a little bit of rope to, to sort of, uh, do my thing within the business. Um, I mean, it's obviously now paid off for him big time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he he uh, he, uh, he still owns uh, you know like a, a big share of the business. Um, but uh, but yes, who knows? I, I certainly I, I I you know he certainly backed me when I was much younger, even though I was making mistakes. And um, anyway, there's uh, there and there are stories of, of some fairly catastrophic mistakes I made in the early days where I was trying to set up my own, like a, a division of Andertons that was going to be a distribution business. And, uh, you know, I, I remember, I remember losing, I think I lost about 60 or 70,000 pounds, you know, it was that hundred thousand dollars of my dad's money in one year on a distribution business that, uh, and that, that was probably the closest feeling to, to, you know, just going, oh, this is, I never ever wanted to let anybody down or, or, you know, and that, that was like, oh, I'm, and I'm sure, you know, you know, Dave, you know, everyone you makes take, mistakes. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> you, you, you take risks and, and, and that's a, a big part of that is why I, I, I suppose I have a philosophy now as well of never being, I'm never, um, what's the right word? I never resent someone else's success. You know, if, they, if they've taken those risks and it's paid off for them and they've, they've been successful and made a lot of money or something like that, I, I'm, I always think, well, you know, all power to you because, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not, you don't get that success without taking some risks. Yeah, right. It's not easy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you were, uh, when you were working in the store in the 80s, did you see like a big resurgence of or a surgence of guitar interest around that time when people were you know well, that whole... was that was actually a big synth time for for us you know in terms of andertons uh, our guitar department probably got scaled back in the 80s to make way for all the korg m1s and dx7s and um interesting Roland junos and all that kind of stuff and so and that was never my you know i never played keyboards or piano or anything like that um and, and actually, if anything, I think the guitar industry uh, had created this uh, virtuoso monster. Why well, no, the guitar industry hadn't created it? That's not true. But what what had happened was, you know, the the, the idea of, of like being a good guitar player in inverted commas was to be Steve Vai or Ingrid Malmsteen or Joe Satriani or you, know, you just end up going like, well, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the population is never going to play at that kind of level. So there was, I think that was, was actually extremely off-putting. Hmm. And then 
of course, the 90s had the explosion of, of uh, over here, we had the Britpop and then you had grunge and all of a sudden it was, you could play three chords and as long as you had a, a you know, as long as you'd written a catchy melody to go over the top of it, you could have um, massive success and be a proper guitar player, but playing pretty basic stuff. And then of course that was, uh, that was huge again and you had this almost like a, the, the, this sort of, the, the the Beatlemania second time round, you know, as all of a sudden everybody's going, well, I want to play, you know, I want to play guitar, you know, and and then it, 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 and it's never really touch wood. It's never really felt like it's uh, sort of gone backwards since then. I think I think there was a when was did you have a big? We had a big craze over here in the nineties, maybe mid to end of the nineties, where the DJ was the new rock started did you get that in the states i don't know if you but not 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 so much not then no but so we we, we definitely are now. members anderson's <laughs> sounds yeah. to say a little later yeah more yeah. prominent nowadays and I, I certainly remember a time again when when you you know you you at christmas you would gear up to sell like cheap dj packages more than cheap guitar packages or whatever but that's definitely um again that, that that's kind of never really come back in the kind of the heyday again. It sort of had its day, I think. It's funny, I recently saw the uh, a meme uh, or an article that said something about the sales of the synth guitar has been has dropped for the 25th year in a row. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I kind of think, you know, in the, in the early days, the synth guitar thing was super cool. It allowed guitar players to put guitar parts, to put synth parts down when they couldn't play and sort of supplement their kind of their sound. But I think nowadays, you, you not only have you got guitar effects processors that make synthy noises, so you don't really need to have that pitch to MIDI vibe going on. I also think that computer programs now are just so simple to put the parts in, even as a novice keyboard player. Um, what's the point of, of trying to play the keyboard on your guitar anymore? Just, just not necessary. Yeah. Um, Plus, it never was a cool look. The whole key no there's a there's a brilliant do you guys know there's a, a guy called neville martin that was the editor of guitarist magazine and that there, there is a a fabulous video of him in the 80s doing a synthax demo so if you if you ever if you want to see like just i don't know it's 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 neville with hair for a start which is awesome and and it's just it's just this <laughs> it's this this awful cringy synthax uh youtube demo uh Anyway, very 80s, and oh, yes, no wonder up. those those guitars aren't popular anymore. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. So I, I imagine the <laughs> keyboard scaled back in the store and guitar section has expanded a huge amount. Indeed. Bump. Indeed. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, we have a we had a comment here from Carlos Figueroa. He said, I just saw your demo on the ESP LTD EC two fifty six. Yeah. Um, that's a long name. <laughs> yeah. Long name. Totally. Uh, but that's cool, though. I mean, do you guys sell stuff all around the world now, or is it still mostly uh, in Europe? It's, it's still about 90% UK. Um, and I, again, I, I've, I've sort of... Uh, the, I, I think that there's, a, there's an element of... There's some products. So we sell pedals, for example. You kind of ship all around the world, and um, every day there's a little package going out to Australia or New Zealand or whatever, somebody's bought a pedal from you. But I, but I think the, the guitars and amps, you know, the, I think it's really important that when you buy a guitar and an amplifier, you know that if you've got a problem with it, uh, that there's somewhere to go back to, to, to have that problem sorted out. And so I'm not really a big believer that it's a brilliant idea to to buy a, 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 an amp or a guitar from a, a business that you've got to send it halfway around the world to get it serviced. So there, there's a, there's you know part of me is kind of um, obviously wants to promote selling online, and I certainly think you know if you're in the UK or certain parts of Europe and you buy online from Andertons and you've got a problem will look after you and it'll be completely seamless and you'll have a replacement product or you'll have you know the next day or you'll have the product collected the next day but absolutely there are parts of the world where we can't do that logistically um and i'd always recommend you buying from a trusted good retailer whether it's online or, or in store but so, you know just somewhere where you know if you've got a problem you can get it sorted out without it being a complete ball lake you know mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Dave, you guys have met, right? I mean, before. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've done many videos together. In case Indeed. We, we always see each other at the NAM show. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we've been a Friedman dealer for about four years. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, we've, we've met each other a few times. Indeed. And again, I'm always fascinated by. I love the stories about you know, and I've, I've, all, I've certainly would love for Dave to you know when he's in the UK to to, to come and and do a, a, a talk about how he. You know, because I, because I, I know the story. You know, you were you were modding stuff and building pedal boards for people and uh, wiring rigs for people yeah. before the before the amp um, business took off. And again, I think it's a before the internet. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I'm you well, know that just I'm always, dated me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm always interested in in kind of how I, well you know Joe Morgan we had on the show about uh, eight weeks ago. Yeah, so, yeah. well, you, there's 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 plans. Or at least talk about me coming over and doing like a whole European thing. So yeah, well, that'd um, be great. You guys, of course, will be a stop uh, along with everyone else and, and their brother while I'm over there. Well, and I do, and and uh, you know, and I, I, I said I'm, I'm always not sure intrigued. when that's going to be yet, but we got to figure that out. Well, and I certainly, I think when we were when we were talking to Joe. Um, I just think I think it's sort of fascinating in that never underestimate how much of your own personality is the reason why people want to buy one of your products. You know, because right. so, it's it's tough. I think you know, guitars and amplifiers are largely not when it gets down to the detail, but largely much the same. You know, guitars are made from wood and they got six strings and amps largely you know follow a similar topography in terms of the way they're going to try and amplify the guitar sound and i think you know i think it's getting across your story you know, your, and your, yeah and your dna and what did you it's really important um mm -hmm. really really and i thought the video with joe was great you know and i loved his you know i love it when joe was um I think he said something like 99 out of 100 guitar players aren't going to really dig my amps, but that's not the guy I'm. That's not the guy I'm going after. And you know, he was just like, effects loops are for pussies and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, good, good for you, man. You know, it's like just say it, say it how it is, and not say it how it is, but say it how you believe it, and say it with conviction. And you're right, that one guy in a hundred is your guy. And let's be honest with you, if you could have a 1% market share of every single amp sold in the world, you'd have a really, really nice business. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, so I, 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 I think it's important that you, that's one of the reasons why I like Paul Reed Smith. You know, there, there is a guy that is not afraid to get up and just give you his opinion with both barrels sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it, and it's it's nice when you you know there's so many of the bigger corporate brands where the the, the company line has to be so vanilla because they don't want to upset anybody, and you just end up going oh, that's cool. But sometimes I just you know you just want to hear you want to hear somebody that's just proud of what he's done and yeah anyway. has, has an opinion. Yeah, yeah. Joe yes. Joe is really good at. Um, talking in front of people or talking to the camera. He's excellent at it. Uh, much better than I am. But uh, but I've gotten better at it over time. You should, and that, I think that's one of the nice things about doing the Anderton's TV thing is that, we're, you know, it, it's super relaxed, super informal, and, you know, that you'll be, you know, there's a constant stream of kind of questions and things, so it doesn't feel like it's awkward and like, oh, I don't know yeah. what to say next. Um, it's all cool. So there we go. Look, that's definitely if you when you're over 100. percent Oh yeah, you'll know, you'll know about it ahead of time if that's all happening. <laughs> so I'm sure uh, Dennis is going to have to arrange that. Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> no, I'd like to see you guys have have Dave on the show. That would be great. Yeah, it would be good fun. Good fun. Um, I did. I just got to go in the right time of the year. Well, <laughs> which yes, is exactly. Well, I guess it depends what what sort of. Uh, what sort of weather you like, but uh, oh, I see we can we can work that out. We can work that out. Um, yeah. You said you saw a question. Ah, oh, it's just loads. I mean, there there was. Uh, we could probably get ourselves in trouble if we answer Richard Boyer's question about what do I think about the new uh, 
um, Steel Panther distortion pedal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell, tell, let's talk about wait, that. Wait, are you going to get yourself in trouble? <laughs> well, only because what's the right answer? I mean, obviously, um, I think you've got to say, you know the vibe here, it's, it's obviously a, an exceptionally uh, misogynistically named uh, distortion pedal for Satchel. Uh, and, and I suppose, ultimately, if you accept that the whole point of Steel Panther is to um, is to take the piss out of how terrible some of those kind of 80s Motley Crue type uh, opinions on women actually was, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and that it's, it, it, it's, it's proper satire. Then I guess to a certain extent you have to you have to take the the, the, the name of the pedal uh, and uh, take it for what it is and and sort of laugh and just accept that actually what Steel Panther is trying to highlight is what was wrong with the industry <laughs> in the eighties. Yeah, but I suppose inevitably there are lots of fans of Steel Panther that think that it's awesome and cool and that actually they would like to go, you know, they, they like that. That is their, they relate to that because that is still their opinion about music and women and stuff like that. And I, su I suppose I do understand from that perspective why it has taken a lot of heat. Um, I think you could still like the pedal and not think that way about women. Yeah, I think, I, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's just, uh, I guess it's the same, isn't it? As, as, uh, you know, there's a lot of comedians who make a living out of making really bad taste jokes, but because you kind of know that, that they don't actually have that opinion, they're just trying to draw attention to how bad it would actually be to really have that opinion in the form of a joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't know. I think I think ultimately in judging that you you sort of have to have a lot of background on who the band is and what yeah. they do. And I, and yeah. what era it came from. Yeah. And I don't I don't think in any way they mean any harm in any way. So well, uh, I mean when I I've certainly met uh the guitar player both in his you know with his satchel thing on and also in his person you know with his not satchel. And he's just a lovely, lovely guy. Uh, mm -hmm. and it is obviously a joke. I mean I think it's a you know, it's clearly a bigger uh it's a bigger issue that um, uh, that still, although although lots and lots more women are playing the guitar, uh, mm -hmm. they're still feeling like they're a pretty tight knit underground community that still aren't feeling like they want to come and engage uh, in the sort of uh, you know YouTube and even in music stores. You know, they're, they're they're kind of doing their own thing, but almost a bit secretly. And I, and I, I kind of think that's, again, that's, a, that's another uh, area of the industry that I would like to feel like we can make a difference uh, to breaking down that barrier so that at some point in the future, um, it, that you don't have this. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you at the moment. Our YouTube channel, according to, the, according to YouTube's uh, analytics, has a 97% male subscriber ratio. You know, and not, and you, ours is ninety nine percent. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. so you talk about, well, you know, with with that's and and when I talk to uh, when I talk to lots of women who play guitar, love playing guitar, and like that, it's not that there are. It's not that like only three percent of guitar players are women. It's just that they don't. Want, it's just they're just not comfortable yet. Maybe engaging in this format, uh, and that I think is is largely the fault of the men that do engage in this format and that not all of them obviously but a percentage of them and their attitudes towards women playing guitar and that's what we've got to try and uh i, I feel anyway we've got to try and address and break down um if we can somehow uh, but do it in a way that isn't condescending and patronizing and uh anyway i talk about i i talk about this lots with especially since i've, I've got two daughters and uh, I don't want them to feel like they're going to, you know, if my eldest one is uh, just starting to, to say, Dad, can I learn to play guitar, please? You know, and I, and I don't want her to grow up um, 
feeling somehow like the guitar community is not somewhere where she's uh, happy and welcomed and comfortable in. Well, that's a huge challenge. God knows how we're going to do that, but we'll, we'll, you know, maybe we can make yeah, a small exactly. dent in it over time. Um, exactly. Yeah. So there we are. It's an interesting topic. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. one I'm sure with your 99% male subscribers, they're not interested in at all. <laughs> 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 <Let's move on>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say I'll play the satchel's pedal into Dave's pink taco amp, and yeah, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everything's that was, great. Hey, that was named after a restaurant. There you Good go. For you. And the so, B, and actually, the B, it was. The B was a completely different. Innocent. B thing. was a. You know, the B was an innocent thing that was. Uh, g g the name was given by an employee of mine, and I wasn't even paying attention at the time, really. <laughs> and it kind of stuck, and wow, <laughs> there we are. Um, uh, you know, I, I have three daughters myself. And yeah, it's, none, it's, a, none, it's none of them. They're all older now, and none of them. So that, I mean, uh, the oldest is twenty five. So uh, none of them have any issues with any of the names at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you know. Oh, it's, I, I do. It's it's much much. It's it's yeah. The, the names of products are probably largely superficial. I mean, it's 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 attitudes of the. It's attitudes. That of I the agree people. with. That um, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. It it it's. Well, look at the the whole the way videos used to be back in the day. I mean, I grew up yeah. in the '80s. It was all about you know women in chains, and you know it was a whole thing. You know, it was it was mm -hmm. very uh, much different. So I, I completely get that totally. Yeah. Um, we actually had a question which was interesting, and I, I uh, it was from Jim Needs, and I wanted I wanted to know as well. How did you and Rob meet, and also uh, the other guys as well as Peter? The, honestly, the Rob, the Rob Chapman one is, I think, a real, uh, it's a real lesson in if you want to talk to someone, why don't you just phone them, you know, or, or and honestly, I, I, I uh, we're, this is 2008, 2009, I, somewhere like that. And, I, and I'd seen, um, uh, I was, I, YouTube exists relatively uh it's relatively young. I don't know what would it have been then, a year or two old, something like that. And I'm watching it, and I've seen Pro Guitar Shop in America with uh, Andy. Um, I forget his surname, but you know, basically Andy from Pro Guitar Shop. Everyone mm -hmm. knows that. Oh yeah. Uh, now Andy of Reverb fame. And I'm and I'm seeing this 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 channel basically just making these amazingly. Uh, just a brilliant, brilliant demos of products, you know, so much more engaging than just a magazine advert or, a, or a, a, a static listing on a website or whatever. You know, it's like, here it is. Here's the actual product being demonstrated in front of your eyes on the Internet. Um, so I'm like immediately going, that's that's uh, that's how you're going to sell something to somebody who can't come to your store. Um, and then. I'm also watching Rob Chapman doing this sort of video blogging kind of thing about his life. Well, not his life, but as in uh, his him as a guitar player. So he's doing a bit of teaching and uh, um, a bit of product demonstrating and a bit of uh, songwriting sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, what I'm seeing with Rob, though, is something that's really engaging. So it's like it's it's there's something about his personality. You know, he's he's just. Uh, he's funny. He's he's easy to watch. He's you 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 immerse yourself. You know you engage with him as he's talking. Anyway, so I thought, oh, I would like to do pro guitar shop style videos with a guy like Rob Chapman. Um, so I just emailed him and said, hello, Rob. <laughs> you know we've never met. I'm from a music store called Andertons. Um, I love your videos. Could we do something together? And he wrote back and went, sure. When do you want to meet up? And that was how it how it kind of happened, and um, I guess you know a, a big part of the success is is you know the chemistry that that Rob and I have when we when we make videos. You know we we, we make each other laugh and we complement each other with our the way we talk about things. Um, so that was that was the the Rob connection. Then and then the the Pete Hanori one is. Uh, 
I'm not going to give you the detail because it's kind of not a moment that I'm terribly proud of, but potentially Pete and I were involved in a fairly car crash video about a product that didn't go great. And Pete decided after that, that maybe it wasn't a great idea that he worked for this brand anymore. And I felt bad that I'd played a part in this too. Oh, so I remember this. Let's not go there. So I said to him, I won't say a word. I won't come say a and, word. I said, Look, come okay. and work for Anderton's and we'll put it all behind us and we'll chalk it off to experience and never talk about it again. <laughs> so uh, yes, well done, Dejo Blue. You have a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't say a word about it on here. But... Oh, well, it, it's look. I mean, it, there you go. If you wanna, if you want uh, a lesson in in uh, in what not to do. Uh, anyway, whatever. Yeah. Let's move I mean, on. Stuff, stuff happens. <laughs> I mean, hey, I mean, there's been videos I've seen other channels where um, things have happened. You know, they say something about something. People get upset. It's like, you know. Yeah, that. that oh, yeah. Just, I, I understand. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think anybody came out of that situation uh, covered in glory. And I think we all learned a, a good lesson and we all moved on. And uh, the silver lining is that, you know, Pete Honore is now one of my closest friends. And uh, we have, again, amazing fun uh, making videos together. And none of that would have happened um, if, you know, <laughs> if, uh, that bad video hadn't happened. So. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I was—I'm sure you know—I was emailing back and forth with Pete as well. Yeah, you know, we were. I was trying to get him with you on the show, um, and then he wrote me back saying that he was interested in coming on. Um, and I just said we the way we had to work it, but I didn't hear back. So uh, oh well, yeah, maybe maybe he'll do it another day. He's I mean, welcome. Yeah. He's welcome anytime. So cool. uh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll tell him. I'll yeah, tell him. Sure. Yeah. Those, so, uh, but um, let's see. Uh, Wow, I just saw a weird, really weird comment that I'm getting rid of right yeah. now. Yeah, we all saw that one, I think. Uh, yeah, like just big, big, my, my eyes just got real big. Um, I didn't see it. Okay, yeah, well, let's, uh, let me just do that. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so can a mod ban that guy? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's done, yeah. so don't worry, guys. Uh, all right, so... I wanted to go back. Oh, so you know, so we were talking about women guitar players and, yeah. and presence on on the web. You know who I really like? Um, Mary Spender. She's lovely. And uh, we did some stuff with Mary last year. And uh, that was a, that was a trial really by me to see if we bought someone in that was more of a just a song, a singer songwriter rather than a product demonstrator. And uh, it kind of, it, it probably didn't pan out how I, I hoped it would in, in that the, the product demonstration side of things wasn't her background. Hmm. Um, so uh, it, it, I found, you know, we, we, were, we were sort of, the format that we had with Mary that was, that worked, I mean, I think she is, uh, she's another, someone that I was watching on YouTube and I asked her to come on the show. I, I thought she's another person. She's, she's, so nat she's so natural in front of the camera. She's so easy to watch. I, you know, she's got a lovely voice, you know, and she's a very talented singer, you know, plays guitar. Um, and I kind of like, I liked her like vlogging stuff. Mm. But but where I think you know she wasn't really in her comfort zone when we would get her in and go right we'll do do a demonstration of this product then and then tell us at the end of it what you kind of thought of that it just wasn't really her um, it wasn't really something that she she'd uh, done before and, and that she didn't I didn't really feel it uh, I didn't really feel it it, it uh, was working great and so we did a, we did a few things and we tried a different bits of formats and then bizarrely she just she got a, a great gig with uh, Sure. And it was just like, you know what, it's fine. You go do your thing and we'll do our I had, thing. And, I, had, I had no idea. Um, I, I, yeah. I brought up her name, but I had no clue. No, but, she, but she's great. And we, we bump into her at NAM and stuff like that. And uh, maybe we, again, we'll do something again in the future. I don't, I don't know. But but um, I, I mean, on that front, I mean, that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we, we did go through when, when Mary uh, stopped um, 
doing the Anderson stuff. We did have this like three or four months where it was like, right, got to find another uh, female presenter to come on the channel. Like, you know, must, 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 must. And again, I just, I just went, you know, we're just trying, we're trying too hard here to fix in inverted commas this perception that it's all women aren't, aren't, you know. And I just, and I, and I sort of taken a step back and just gone, you know what? Uh, it'll happen at some point or other. The right, you know, we'll meet the right one, and and it'll be amazing, and it'll really add something special to the channel. But I don't. I didn't necessarily feel like it was working where I was trying to force it. And that, I think, taught me, not taught me, but that, I think, gave me an interesting, you know, I don't I don't think it's a situation, I don't think men trying to force the change is the right way to go about it. I think it, it's, it's, it's certainly for men to, to, to take some responsibility and go, I need to treat women respectfully and not not do things that exclude them from this world but i just felt that it it it, it felt contrived to 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 then almost go beyond that and actually sort of you know that the next thing is for is for women to just go right i want to you know okay let's let's engage and be a part of it and anyway yeah we've got no, the same conversation again so <laughs> No, it's just that question was from Jay Parmar, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, I mean, it's we look. I mean, you mentioned, you know, we 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 through the whole YouTube thing, we we start. We you know, Rabir is somebody that 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 we you know, we met. The Rabir story is amazing. I'm doing videos with Rob in Guildford. This is seven eight years ago, and right. we go for we go for lunch at a local pizza place, and Rabir is behind the counter serving the pizzas. And Rob literally says to him, you look like a guitar player or something along these lines. And Rabir's like, yeah, I am a guitar player. I'm studying at uh, this local music college and I just work here, you know, part time like that. And Rob's like, we should jam. And it's like, it's just crazy. That like, <laughs> I mean, like, what are the chances of that? And and then, you know, so Rabir and Rob do the band and we, you know, we have Rabir on our YouTube channel, and and, and, he and has, he's great too. Uh, and he's just, he's amazing. Yeah. I mean, he is honestly one of the best guitar players I've ever met. And it's yeah, like he's amazing. What, and that that was not, you know, people might think, oh, the way that you get onto Andertons is you have, like, we have these auditions, and you have hundreds of people, and the best one gets it. It's like totally not that at all. We just, you know, you just get randomly meet someone, and yes, yeah, just maybe it's just it was always meant to be um so that's cool and then mick taylor we'd like i'd like to do some more with we we were doing something with mick and then mick started that, that pedal show with dan steinhardt mm. and i'm i'm hoping somehow or other we can you know mick will come back and do a bit more ariel posen you know he's uh, the canadian guy from brothers landreth amazing guitar player that we we have on the show fairly regularly uh Paul Heinmarsh, I saw his name come up. Paul, Paul again was was a guy we did a bit with, uh, phenomenal guitar player. And then he got um, he got offered a, a really great job with uh, Line Six that meant he he wouldn't be able to do the videos with us anymore. But mm. again, great guy. With Joss Allen, we had recently who who he was with us for about a year, and again he's just recently left to try and do his own YouTube thing. Again, super talented, more of a kind of a you know Rocky Shred guy. Good, good player. So again, we've met, we've had, like, I hope I haven't missed anybody. I'm going to feel bad if I've missed anybody now. <laughs> well, yeah, there was one other guy that um, just recently left, uh, Joss. That's Joss, yeah, Joss Allen. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. Um, Matt Hornby that does the stuff with Rabir and sounds like, again, he's, he's uh, you know, he's a little bit more like me in the sense of, you know, he, he's not necessarily the greatest guitar player ever, um, but he's great on camera and he's funny and he's a really good part of that kind of him and Rabir have great chemistry. Um, oh, I feel bad now because I just know I've forgotten somebody, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Blanket okay. apology. <laughs> no, it's yeah. great. I mean, you guys have a lot of, you know, great, different characters, different personalities. I mean, it's, it's really cool. Uh, yeah. and someone was saying before, you know, a lot of different content um, as well. So uh, it's funny, we have a, quite a comment here, Dave. Hanner Goosen, Gunson says, I wouldn't have bought a Friedman if it, there wasn't Tone Talk. <laughs> wow, see? So there you go, there there's, go. A, there's an <laughs> N of one. 
There's an N of one that it helped. It helped sell one amp at least. Well, oh, enjoy <laughs> your amp. That's awesome. That's very cool. Um, so I actually saw a great video. I wanted to mention it where you were blindfolded, Lee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they handed you your own guitar, which was great. Um, but then there was also one where you were you were blindfolded, and one of the top amps that you picked was the uh, Blues Cube. Yeah. From the roll from Roland, I wrote yeah. Yoshi immediately after that. I was like, Yoshi, you have to see this video because <laughs> yeah. I was like, it was you know, you know, all these other tube heads and everything, and I was really I was really impressed with that. I thought that uh, uh, the, the the blindfold thing. I mean, we were doing blindfold challenges years and years ago. Just uh, I don't know. Rob and I would just like tie a t-shirt around our head or something, and and and. And they they were they were done at first just for their comedy effect, um, and then I just I just read through my own experience of going like, oh my god, like if I can see what the products are, I'm totally drawn to certain brands and certain products, and it, and not just visually, like what like hourly as well, you know, as in I'm genuinely thinking that certain things sound better than other things. And then when I blindfold myself, I'm genuinely, genuinely uh, not coming to the same conclusions, which is, so it was like a freaky sort of, you know, like crappy scientific experiment of going, wow, that's the power of brand. And I, and I know some of it, to be fair, you know, you meet people in this industry and you become friends with them and then all of a sudden you're like going oh okay well I'm going to say something nice about you find yourself saying something nice about a product which really what you're actually saying is something nice about the person that you know rather than necessarily because you think the product's so great so the blindfold thing kind of came about as well that that's that's the way to um to take that away you know so you just go okay all right well let, let's do it let, let's just blindfold ourselves and it started off with you know see if you can uh, well we've done all sorts really you know can you um pick your favorite product which product do you think is the most expensive one which do you think is the cheapest all that kind of stuff and and uh we did one i don't think it's no it hasn't gone out yet but the last time rob was in we took that experiment thing to another level i got five american paul reed smith guitars and let rob play them and choose the one that he liked the best with no blindfold. So like, just you choose the one that you would, if, you know, if you could have everyone, any one of these, you choose it, which one would you have? Hmm. And then we put the blindfold on him and then said, now pick the one that you would take. And I'm not gonna tell you what happens because the video is not up yet, but it's, let's just say that the results absolutely do conclude that your eyes play an incredibly important role in your brain telling you which one you think is the best sounding product mm -hmm. you know which is crazy you know it is crazy um it is it is i mean uh, i i haven't done it dave when you're making a product or you're working on your amps or pedals or anything do you, do you ever go through that process of uh you know the blind uh yeah i've been using that kind of method for people even even customers and stuff for years like using an amp switcher and actually switching into in real time with their back turn mm. uh you know it, it, them thinking well your amp can't do this sound of this amp okay well bring bring your amp in and we'll see about yeah. that so i dial yeah. it in and then have them hand him the guitar i go which amp is which mm. well <laughs> and I, tell you, can, I can't can, tell the, the, the blindfold kemper stuff is probably some of the more most frightening stuff you know, where, where you literally are, you know, when you, when you can see which one is the Kemper and which one is the real amp, you're absolutely convinced that you can, that the real amp sounds more authentic or whatever, you know, better in inverted commas. And then as soon as the blindfold goes on, it's like, I don't know, we just, well, as I said, you can see in the video, we, we've, we've probably done 15 or 20 different amps now and, and it's just, difficult man you know really difficult but there we go <laughs> even when the amps loud like you know has some volume and 
No, I think that that was probably the the latest one we were playing around with. I don't know if Dave's or either of you have seen that UAD Ox, you know, the Ox box thing, which yeah, is, yeah. Which yeah. is yeah. more of an attenuator with uh, speaker emulation on it. And definitely, definitely, we begun to to uh, we begun to 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 find it easier to spot which was the real amp versus the Kemper when you could really gun the amplifier. And yeah, of course, it's, some, then, it's just the feel. It's mm. kind of the feel. It's not that it can't mimic, kind of mimic the tone at a low volume, but when, for me, it's always the feel of it. It doesn't mm. feel the same. It doesn't produce the same kind of, it's a little flatter and it, and doesn't produce the same kind of, um, yeah, but it, but it's air around it, so to speak. You know, it's not, yeah, it's still, again, I think, it, you know, if you're running the stuff, at if you're running the stuff at, a, at the, the real amplifier at a volume level where you're not really getting any compression from the power section uh it's bloody hard to to, to hear the difference between a, a kemper profile and, and the real thing um and, and you know and i i sort of you know here's a good debate really and a good one to have dave in on the com you know there's a there's a i have a moral dilemma with kemper in the sense of oh yeah you know, is, is it is it morally right uh that a piece of technology should be able to uh imitate another amplifier that you've put hundreds of hours of r d into and da, 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 and then all of a sudden it's like great as fast as you can finish that amplifier this piece of technology just goes fine press the mimic button boom there you go and then I so kind of look at it like music piracy, sort of. Yeah, I, or, I or, can. Or, or, the, or the beginnings of that. Um, it, the, there's another problem with the Kemper. Is like, yes, you can you can do your capture of of your amp and whatever, and you can get your amp in one setting. Mm -hmm. But the other problem is is when you're on stage using a Kemper, if you want to change that setting. That's not, it's not like mm. a modeled amp. Yeah. It's a snapshot of the amp set a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. So you, if you change the EQ, it, it superimposes their EQ on top of that, yeah. that sound. It doesn't react the same way. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, and that's I, kind I, of a problem. I, I certainly think that, that uh, you, you can, the, the debate, the debate will go on and on about the pros and cons of Kemper from a, I, I totally agree. It's, it's not the same product and it is just a snapshot but then of course the touring guitar player is going to go yeah but you know look at how convenient it is and blah blah blah. you know i get that mm -hmm. and i don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that there's just different opinions i, I think the the moral one is is the one where i'm sort of just yeah. going you know and we shouldn't just really uh point the finger at kemper i mean that's arguably any uh product that is claiming to sound like another one you know that there's, yeah. there's, there's an element of like okay but i suppose the kemper i suppose the reason the finger gets pointed at the kemper is because it actually is uh a mimic of that amp as opposed to someone that's programmed something to try and get it to sound like but yeah so i don't know it's and you're right you know that the, the the piracy you know there's a lot of there's a lot of um I understand that whole music piracy kind of attitude towards what they're doing. And, and I don't really know where, you know, the, the, I mean, the, the thing is Kemper needs guys like you to keep building amplifiers for them to. Yeah, what, what happens if they stop building amplifiers or, you know, yeah, so, so what, it's, what are you going to model? It's a sort of symbiotic sort of relationship, isn't it? But, but mm -hmm. one that um, financially, uh, you know, needs to. Tr I don't know. You, you know w whether or not some sort of licensing arrangement needs to be done, and blah blah blah. But it should I, be. It I should don't be. know. But it, it's perhaps in you know in five years' time or ten years' time, it'll 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 play itself out and work itself out. But who knows? I see a lot of people that have been using stuff like that for a while, and also now reverting back to going back to a simple amp, uh, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's a smaller amp, so they can travel and stuff because. They get tired of um, paging through things to change things, and and uh, you know it's just like oh, I just want to change the gain, and oh wait, what page is that on in the Axe Effects, or what page is that? Yeah, yeah. Where, where is that? I just want to turn a knob, you yeah, know, quick and easy and fast. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, none, I, I, none of that is quick and easy and fast. No, I, I mean that that for that's always been my experience of uh, at some point during a, a video where we're using a a, a, a a product like Kemper or Helix, or at some point, and this usually gets edited out so you don't hear it, but at some point one of the guys will go or I'll go. Where was the, uh, how do we like get the preset into the favorites bank of adding the Revo? And, and then there'll be like four blokes all standing around who none, none of whom have read the manual doing the man thing of all just pressing the buttons to see yeah. what and and, 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 ten yeah. minutes 10 minutes later, you work out how to do it. And you did sort of think so, that's 10 minutes of my life I'm never gonna get back. And I really wish I could have just turned around and adjusted the reverb on the app, <laughs> but it would have been yeah. tough. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, but I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky another one. tool. It's another tool, and yeah, yeah. And in all fairness, you know, we should. It's not fair. We should have had Christoph on the show, and he could have defended himself, and he's not here to do it. So I'll, we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on. Sure. No, I mean, it, I, I agree with you. There's, there's room for everything. I yeah. think you know, people felt the same way when the pod came out, right? They were like, oh my god, I remember the pod came out. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, right. oh, I don't, I don't need an amp, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that uh, funny enough, and that's that's the that's the one thing I wonder. You know, I'm pretty sure that in 2030, uh, if somebody comes into Anderton's, assuming you know, let's hope that we're still here with a uh, a 2015 Friedman BE100, we'll be just like, oh, awesome, yeah, we'll take that in on part exchange. That's great, and that'll still have a value, and everything's good. But in 2030, is anybody going to come in with a 2015? Axe effects or Kemper and us go. Yeah, and have it be a valuable value. Yeah, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. You know, I mean, great I, point. I, I, I'm going back even before the pod. Do you guys remember the, the Zoom 9002? Do you remember yeah, that? Sure. that went on us? Yeah, sure. And honestly, that that was that was when I again I just started in Andertons, and I remember we used to sell. We we would have a guy in the store, and he would stand and play "Jump" by Van Halen all day long <laughs> with a Zoom nine thousand two, and every customer that came in the store would buy one. We would start a Saturday with like a pile of twenty of these things, and by the end of the Saturday, they've all gone. Anyway, about two months ago, someone came in with a Zoom nine thousand two to part exchange, and I'm just like, oh wow, I remember these things like awesome. And you and you plug the thing in, you just go. This is the shittiest sounding, <laughs> like, waspish, oh, You're like, wow. Wasp. Yeah, and you're just going, wow. How did that? And yet, I don't know. I remember a time when you just, we just, I don't know. This was the oh, best. That was the best, right? Ever. Or, so or remember the rock, the rock, like the Rocktron? Yeah, well, the, like the rock box or whatever it was called. So I think there's probably an element that you've got to be realistic and say technology never, you know, it will always be superseded and become you know, worthless over time, whereas a good valve amplifier probably won't, you know. Yeah. He That's says, good. who knows? No, you never who know. Knows? That's a good point, though. Yeah. We have a question from Stan, Stan Adams. He wants to know how well, and I'll, I'll add on to it, but how well does EVH gear sell in England? And kind of to that, I was curious, how well does, what's what's some of the best brands that sell in, in your store? But, um, yeah. I mean, again, if you, I, I think, I think the electric guitar market is probably our most conservative. It feels to me like that's the most conservative customer. So the electric guitar market is super heavily dominated by Fender and Gibson and the brands that you know and love. You know, P PRS is probably the only, you know, modern in inverted commas like brand that 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 uh, that sells well. I say that actually. I mean, again, we we've done well with the Chapman thing. Um, but it but it feels to me like new brands in the electric guitar market have a really tough time breaking through. Then the the amp market is a little bit more open minded. So you know you, you, I don't think customers are quite so wedded to having to have an old Marshall or an old Vox or a Fender or something like that. You know they will take a look at new brands and obviously you know Dave um, can attest to, to that being the case. You know people are quite willing to. Uh, you know, buy, you know, try a Friedman and buy a Friedman and then they're not, they don't get too hung up about the fact that it hasn't got a name on it that wasn't around in the 60s. Um, and so amps wise, Fender will still be number one. Uh, and then actually past that, I was saying that the, the backline market for us is, is, is quite an interesting one because uh, we, we've seen 
a little bit of growth every year in backline. I, th I think the general consensus that the, is that the backline market's actually been shrinking over the last 10 years. But we, we've always seen a little bit of growth. But if I go back 10 years, we, we were doing 100% of our backline turnover with probably four brands. You know, we could have had Fender, Marshall, Blackstar and Vox or Orange or something, you know, that would have done it all. Mm -hmm. And now I probably do 30 brands, literally 30 brands to, 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 to try and achieve my sort of backline target. And there's a lot of businesses doing like, a little bit but like an okay and and i think again customers now they're so well informed through the power of, of youtube and the internet that they discover all of these less well-known brands and that's what they want when they come into the store like that's mm -hmm. the one i want you know and so as the retailer you you've got to carry uh, a big selection of, of product to satisfy the demand of all the customers so that's a challenge you know i mean again Commercially speaking, it was it was more profitable for me when we could do all of our amp sales with four brands. Uh, now, obviously, doing our amp sales with thirty different brands, it's more of a challenge. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, and pedals is even more insane. You know, we, we oh, probably yeah. do <laughs> three hundred brands of pedal, and that's almost like the opposite in that the the customer. Uh, seems to want to dis, you know, they're, they're almost more interested in the pedal they've never heard of. You know, that, that's almost like the total polar opposite of the electric right. guitar market. Um, and as fast as you can start stocking the latest new weird and wonderful pedal from, I mean, we sell pedals from countries that I've never even heard of. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, there's, there's a demand for it. Um, you've still got the, you know, Boss and 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 who are the big ones? You know, Boss. Digitech. And, yeah, like uh, uh, MXR and yeah. Electro Harmonics and stuff. But not again. If you go back fifteen years, though, you know, Boss would have probably had seventy five percent market share of the pedal market. You know, I'd be amazed now if they've got more than ten percent market share. Um, so, it's yeah. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of choices in the pedal market. That's for sure. Yeah, and as as Dave knows, you know, it's very attractive for brands to go. Well, we'll make a pedal, you know, and and if you've got if you've got a good brand name like Friedman has, and and you know, you can get in there and you can do another distortion pedal, you know, to go with the ten thousand yeah. distortion pedals that are already there. And guitar players will go, yeah, I I give it a try. I'm, I'll buy it. And you know, I mean. The yeah, I mean, you, you, BOD was extremely successful. Yeah, yeah, BOD. I mean, on the scope of pedal sales, off the charts. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's. I think I honestly do. I think our pedal counter in in Andertons is like a, it's like the old fashioned cigarette counter in the newsagent. You know, it's like it's you get drawn in, and you're just like you get addicted, and every week you just want to come in and buy another pedal, or every month or whatever. And it's a great way. You know, if you're, I think every guitar player, every guitar player wants to buy stuff. You know, they, 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 I don't think there's a guitar player on earth that just goes, oh, I'm totally happy, man. I've got the amp, I've got the guitar. I've got those two pedals that I bought in 2004. And, you know, it's like the guitar <laughs> it's, player just- It's rare, it's rare. Yeah, yeah, it wants to buy stuff. And I think once you get to the point where you own a few nice guitars and a couple of nice amplifiers, um, it becomes too expensive to just say, yeah, I'll, I'll buy another guitar this month or I'll buy another amp this month because the level that you want to shop at is, is you know, into the thousands of, of dollars or pounds or whatever. But the pedal market, whether your, you know, whether your budget is 30 bucks, 40 bucks every couple of months or your budget's 200 bucks, 300 bucks every couple of months, you can just pedal out like non-stop forever and even if you bought another pedal every week for the rest of your life you still wouldn't buy every single pedal that there is that you could buy no and so it's just i just think it's just um i mean that that's fun enough is one of the things that i do you know if i could jump in a time machine and go back 20 years i'd have started a pedal brand 100 percent, i'd have started a pedal brand <laughs> Um, but there we go. Yeah. Hey, you know, there's a question here that I, I was curious about as well. And I wanted to ask you, um, Mark, ironically enough with a K, yeah. uh, as he says, Anderton's in New York city one day, 
um, I, I mean, I, I, the, 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 well, no is the short answer, uh, unless, unless some kind of interesting franchise opportunity comes along. Um, but I, when I was in my 20s and before I had a family, uh, I absolutely had ambitions of having lots of Andertons, uh, you know, stores and, and, and world domination, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the internet came along and actually allowed us to sort of grow the business without necessarily needing to open more branches, uh, yeah. which was cool. Um, yeah. And then my family came along and actually being home by six o'clock, although tonight I won't be home by six o'clock, uh, but being home by six o'clock every night became the more important than anything. Um, and so, no, I have zero ambition to, uh, not ambition is the wrong word, but you know, I, I, I would much rather see my uh, girls growing up uh, than have Tons of Anderton stories around the world. Yeah, I think yeah, it yes. might even be, I might even be hard, you know, I've, the retail market for brick and mortar stores in the states is it's tough. It's tough. I wouldn't. Mm. I would. I would. Wouldn't want to go in that market. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. it, it, it's it's sort of tough, but um, because here it seems like it's really driven by online sales more so than anything. But and, I think that's uh, that's that's because well number one in america i've always and i think you've just changed the law on this but i've always thought it's terribly unfair on the bricks and mortar store that they have to charge sales tax on every sale and the online store can ship from one state to another and avoid paying that sales tax yeah they, they, that, did, that just changed yeah so that's changed and i, I don't think it's in effect yet though but it's right because I, I, it's going to create a problem though so I'm well, always talking about the problems. Uh, not no, well. You obviously have to file uh, uh, sales tax uh, returns for every state, right? But then um, someone was saying also that you might have to file state uh, state tax also, like state income right. tax also so, uh, well, for right every there. state, which is a problem, and that's based on your mm. gross sales. So you're going to pay. You can't. It can't be based on your gross sales because yeah, you didn't sell that in that state. So I don't know what's happening with that exactly. Well, okay. so so certainly for a start, I think you know it's it's not fair. You know, bricks and mortar retailers, by their very nature, have a higher overhead than an online retailer most mm -hmm. of the time, anyway. And then you lump in the fact that they're also at a disadvantage with the sales tax thing. It's just you know I thought it was unfair. Having said that, though, your uh, I think most bricks and mortar retailers have to look at um have to look at what it is that they're offering the consumer as an experience <coughs> as an experience mm -hmm. because you know if the experience if the experience of going to your local music store is fundamentally not a terribly enjoyable one you know it's a bit of a hassle or the sales guy's a bit creepy or the the location of the store is not great or, you know, what are the demonstration facilities aren't great or whatever. Is it any wonder that somebody would just click a button and have the product delivered to their door without, you know, I mean, of course that's what's mm -hmm. going to happen, but mm -hmm. what bricks and mortar stores have an opportunity to do. And I think, I hope what we've done in Anderson's is create a really vibrant place for the music community to gather, um, to have, I mean, we don't have a commission for any of our salespeople. So we, we, we drum into our sales guys that the, the, the big win for us is to have a relationship with a customer for the entire life of that customer right. rather, rather than, Oh, sell that guy a $500 guitar today. You know, that's not the win for us. Um, and so it's really relaxed in here. The sales guys are all nice and comfortable because they're not under pressure to sell you anything that you don't want. The demonstration facilities are good. The selection of product is good. You know, it's just we don't have like skull and crossbones on the expensive guitars going, you know, if you touch this, you will die. You know, it's like <laughs> if, a, if, a, if a 15 year old kid comes in and says, can I try that three thousand pound Les Paul, please? It's like, sure. I mean, I know that the chances of this 15 year old kid dumping three thousand bucks on the guitar that day are unlikely but 
and that's not the point you know he's gonna he's just gonna leave that still going oh man this is the best guitar i've ever played i've got to do something and i love andertons and it's just like why wouldn't you you know why wouldn't you want to uh encourage people to just come in but so so that's my you know i mean it's an enormous challenge for a brand like guitar center who have 280 stores and thousands and thousands of staff to, to try and ensure that the experience for every single customer is consistently great and i, and I do understand I and mean, that's a big big challenge but for for independent retailers um i think they've got to look at you they've got they can't just keep blaming the internet for their decline in sales. I think they have to look closer to home and go, what am I doing in my store today to make guitar players or whatever instrument you sell want to come in? You know, what, what am I doing? And, it, and if I'm not doing anything and I'm a little bit grumpy and I feel like the world owes me a living or whatever like that, and, you know, it's just like, well, I'm afraid you're the reason that you're going out of business not the internet you know but there we are he says i'll get off my soapbox now and no i think no, I, no I totally understand i think you're right too yeah i agree with you i mean even even online retailers like uh, sweetwater mm. will go out of their way to make you feel important make you feel like a good customer to even if you haven't bought anything i mean i, I just recently got an email from my sales guy at sweetwater and Said he checked out the show and was curious if you know if he can help me with anything. And I was like, "That's great, you know. Yeah. That's that's uh, I I felt like okay, you know, he cares, and I, I'll come back." Yeah, I'm fascinated with the Sweetwater thing. I mean, that's I think uh, Britain or you know generally British people, and I, I can't talk for other European nationalities, but I don't think we like the idea of somebody phoning us and trying to sell us something. Um, you know, I, so I'm, I'm fascinated, because Sweetwater is held up as such a shining example of a very successful business. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I understand, you know, that, that I understand that, you know, that they're sort of, what, are they, they don't, what do they call their salespeople? They're not called sales, sales engineers. Sales engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, and I love the fact that they can phone you and go, hey, Mark, you know, it's Bob here from Sweetwater. How's it going? How's that guitar cable you bought the other day? You know, I, it's just, it's an insane thing. And he's going to tell you about a new pedal they've got that he thinks you might like. And I, I just, I just don't think culturally you could replicate that in the UK. But maybe you could, maybe I'll try, you know, maybe, maybe we'll, 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 maybe I need to do, I should ask the people watching Tone Talk, if you live in the UK, is that the kind of thing you'd like? I guess if you had it really right and it was really natural and it really felt like the guy phoning you was your like trying to help you out and acting in your best interest. There's a very fine line with it. It's it <laughs> mm. when it becomes um, completely annoying mm. or, or helpful. I, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a very thin line there. I've never felt that Sweetwater, at least for me, has been annoying. Typically, the call rate that I've gotten from them is like once every few months, if not longer. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like several months or even maybe five, six months, and I'll, I'll hear from the guy. But maybe maybe it happens more frequently depending on how much you spend. I don't know. Um, it's certainly not going to work in every culture. I mean, it's not going to work in Japan either. Yeah. Uh, you know, Japan has a completely different culture, right? Yeah. So I can see it, how you have to be a adapt to it but yeah even you know um, i'm reading all the comments i think i, I think the Eng the british people and you know are re uh, i think i'm fairly in tune with my fellow <laughs> brits yeah, uh, e -bar, but, uh, so you call me and i'll fight you exactly it's just like it really is it's just like i don't know what it's obviously a sense of we like our personal privacy and space and everything and it's just like i love it look at that uh, what i don't even answer the phone when my mother calls it's basically that that <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of that's about it but um uh, so it's you know as i i don't want to take anything away from um you know what an amazing business uh sweetwater is and, and actually in fairness in europe you know we, we, there is a, a similar size in fact of anything it might be a bit larger but retailer called toman in, in germany right mm -hmm. you know who again it's it's very much uh a similar uh 
operation in the sense of it's absolutely in the middle of nowhere. You know, there's 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 zero density of population there where they are. It's all mail order and online business, and it's it's an enormous catalog of product. Um, and now, yeah, and now there's Tolman US. Yeah. Really? Um, yes. Yeah. Now, yeah, and they and they still ship though from Europe. Well, again, I think you know they're shipping. They, they well, I don't know. Sort of deal. It's, it's. I mean, their volume is is huge. I, th I think somebody said to me that they're nearly at a billion euros. So I guess their shipping rates. You know, they're probably sending a container every day out to America or whatever. So, uh, or potentially. I mean, that'll be a. I mean, that'll set the cat amongst the pigeons. That'll be an interesting one to see a, a European retailer trying to take a piece of the U.S. market. I shall watch that with interest from over here. <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's. It, so I'm just saying that, that you know you 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 know Sweetwater Tome and there's some some good businesses. I never really felt, I said with the Andertons thing, it was never about size. You know, it, it never needed. I never had this thing about setting a a goal of having to have a certain size of business or turnover and and that being the target. It was all about um, just the quality of the experience. You know, and just going well and and, and reputation. You know, if I if I if I can run a you know if I if, if I know as I leave the store every day that you know our reputation is intact, and it's the, you know it's like people have had a great time coming here and and uh, they've been looked after. That kind of everything else will look after itself, you know. Yeah. Um, and this and it gets to a point as well. I know this this sounds terrible, but how much money do you need? You know, it's like we I don't know. I'm, I've never been the guy that just sort of went oh. You know, I need the yacht and the house in Monaco and everything. It's just like, I have, you know, I have a good living and I drive a nice car and I live in a nice house and my girls go to a good school and it's just a bit like, and, and I'm happy. You know, the, the number one measurement of life, you know, life goals. Exactly. I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> and then you just go, there we go. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I've at least for me, I've had these thoughts about well, I could do this, and the pressure and the amount of time I'm going to be away from my family and X, Y, and Z. Like I had got, I received an offer with my company at one point a couple of years ago to move out to Germany mm -hmm. and be out there for two years. I was like, well, I could have moved my family out there, but it would have been a whole thing. Yeah. Now the opportunity would have been great, but I. I couldn't do it. I just said, no, I'm happy. I'm my family's happy. My kids are in school, everything. It would just be so disruptive to everything. And I was like, I couldn't do it. So I, I, I can relate to, you know, doing what's best for you and your family. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, Lee, I want to make sure that you're okay with time. How are you doing on time? Yeah, I should probably think about heading off home soon, but uh, okay. and I do also feel perhaps it, perhaps it's a, a slightly misleading, um, uh, title of, of the show here is we really haven't talked tone very much other than perhaps the brief talk about Kempers and, and the like. Well, I was going to um, get to uh, some some things, but go ahead. But yeah, no. So if, if we want to do another sort of 10 minutes or so talking about tone and, and stuff, and then I guess I better split, um, then, you know, by all means, fire away with the last, we, we'd perhaps do some roundup questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. I was actually curious about some of your favorite pieces of gear that you've acquired from the store over the over the years. Ooh, well, obviously, uh, all the Friedman amps and pedals that I own are amazing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've I just, got. I just uh, got you a dinner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just doing the. Uh, I'm going to be a bit late home. Uh, message. Um, I, I guess I, I guess I did buy uh, a custom shop Les Paul. Uh, that that I'm, I'm, I, I do totally understand that there is this sort of uh, law of diminishing returns when you buy good gear, and you know you get through all the Chinese Far Eastern made stuff, and every time you spend an extra hundred bucks, you get some kind of next feature set upwards and everything and then you get to like a thousand bucks or fifteen hundred bucks or whatever and it, it kind of feels like you know a lot more money to get a little bit more product or whatever mm -hmm. um and i've sort of always battled with this like you know is it 
you know, how, how much of the guitars when I, you're spending four or five thousand pounds, you know, how much of it is it just, a, you know, an ego trip and going, oh, well, it's just because I've got the cash and how much actually is it that, um, you know, it is a good guitar. Uh, but I've got a, I've got a, 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 a 2014 um, 58 Les Paul reissue from the Gibson Custom Shop, which was pretty expensive, you know, it's about three and a half, four thousand uh, then. Mm. And that's just one of those guitars that keeps um, it keeps giving me that tingly sensation every time I pick it up. And the, 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 you know that the, there's the, you know you, I don't know that anyone yeah, can necessarily hit. Yeah, and 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 that I've got a couple of guitars like that which were ex both pretty expensive. One's a custom shop Strat as well. And it's like, oh, they are really good, and and I get it, and and I, and I'm also very realistic that, you know, there's no guitar in the world it's worth physically, you know, going without food or or not having a house to live in. You know, it's like, <laughs> you, you know, priorities. You get your priorities right. Um, but I do love those. So to, and then amps wise, I I, I got. I mean, I'm a firm firm valve amp lover despite the fact that in one of the blindfold videos i did i did choose a, a roland blues cube as my favorite amplifier but I'm a, I'm a i'm a big i'm a big believer that there's a certain there's a that, that ultimate level of euphoria that you get when playing a, the guitar comes when just everything comes together you know so you're you, you play something good the guitar you've got is just doing all the good things the amp that you're plugged into is just giving that sweet you know and then the, and it's a real and, and if any one of those things is missing you you can never quite reach those euphoric mm -hmm. states you know it's like um I, I always think of different analogies of this but you, I, I don't know it's it's a it could be it could be anything you know sailing a boat you know it's it's the, the crew's got to be right that the, the boat's got to be right the wind's got to be right the the current's got to be you know but then when you get that for anyone that's ever sailed and all of a sudden you know you hit that thing and the boat takes off and you're just like whoo it's like no one thing made that happen it was just like a whole load of different things happened um and i feel like that so gear wise uh it's, it's i probably never I don't think I have the same, and I don't think I don't think I have the same um, emotional tie to an amp or a pedal that I've perhaps had to a guitar. Um, I probably see amps and pedals as more uh, tools to to create a sound that I want it to create, whereas mm. guitars I probably get a little bit more emotionally vested in. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's fairly typical of guitar players. Whether you know, I mean, D Dave, I, I guess is maybe um, <laughs> perhaps you do. Perhaps you feel more like that about about amps. Yeah, um, I, I have. I have a few amps that I'm very attached to. You know, mm, so. I think that's probably an experience thing, though. I don't think I've had that. Um, I, I certainly know customers that talk about having old Marshalls or something that are just you know, it's the yeah. one. Um, and I've probably not owned enough different amps, certainly not vintage amps, to to, to have experienced that. But uh, yeah, so it would be my it would be my I have a fifty eight Les Paul reissue and a fifty four Strat reissue. Um, they would be my two. You know, if I had to sell everything else, they'd be the two things that I'd want to keep. Gotcha. And in terms of like your own interests of guitar what, what do you gravitate towards more uh humbuckers single coils what's your um that is one where uh i do feel the need to um i do i, I do like the idea of being able to plug uh, pick up a guitar that is different you know periodically just to just to sort of refresh you know just get a different sound and a feel um i'm probably uh, i'm just trying to think of who all my, i mean if i look at all my favorite guitar players it, it's going to be quite stratty i would have thought you know it's going to be eric clapton dave gilmore jimmy hendrix hmm. um probably more but then 
John, yeah, John Mayer. Um, <coughs> it's probably going to be more stratty than than Les Paul. But but again, it, you, you know, you, you hear a, a good um, oh, I don't know, slap Paul Kossoff. You know, it's just like oh man, Amazing, you know, that tone. tone tone to for days. Yeah, days and days. You know, and and you can't get that sound out of the strap. You know, I mean, that's that's just a hundred percent. It has to be Les Paul. You know, that's um, true. So yeah, yeah I agree. I'm more of a humbucker guy myself, but yeah, I get it. Yeah, and I go, I go both. Different, <laughs> different, you know, different, uh, different sounds, different things, different tones. Yeah, I think I'm with Dave on that one. In that, honestly, I think that that would be if somebody did the whole desert island thing, and it was just like you get one rig forever, and that's all it can ever be. I think that that would depress me more. I don't know. Just be like, really? It's like, is it half the joy of playing the guitar is the fact that there are so many different yeah, guitars yeah, exactly. and stuff that, and, and amps and pedals and stuff that you can that you can plug into. I probably, if someone said you could only have one thing forever, I'd probably just say oh, I have an acoustic guitar then, and then I won't get too depressed about the fact that I haven't got lots of different electric guitars. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's actually, yeah. not, not a bad Perfect. idea, actually. Perfect. That, that'll work. Someone, um, uh, someone said in the chat, uh, uh, "Do you ever have any plans on uh, making your store larger?" Uh, yes. It uh, seems like you've outgrown it. They said. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have, and and unfortunately, in in where we are in the UK, um, we don't have you know we don't have the the the, the kind of land that that are available in in certainly in in the states and, and and a lot of the uk is very built up now so it's either uh, it's just cost prohibitive to to kind of have the size of store that you would want to have uh but uh you know yes th th it, there are things that we're working on extensions and bits and bobs like that that i'd like to do i mean we're never i'm not sure in in guildford if we were realistic i mean this will to put things in perspective i looked at a I looked at a 20,000 square foot uh, retail unit on a retail park in Guildford about three years ago. And uh, it was a big consumer electronics business that had closed and the property was vacant. And it was nearly $2 million a year rent and rates. That's rent and taxes. Wow. And I, I can't. You, physically, I could not sell enough guitars and pedals and amps to justify mm -hmm. that. You know, the Andertons would be bust in a yeah, year. Why, why take that kind uh, of risk? Yeah. Yeah. So I think to a certain extent, you know, that there are uh, where we are in the UK. We're in a we're in a, a fairly densely populated, expensive area to live. Um, property is expensive here, and I guess it just. It is what it is. We make do, you know, it's not the size, it's what you do with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we should just end right there. Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good end. <laughs> um, so, well, it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's been a total pleasure to have you on. Thank well, you so much. Captain. Well done to everybody who's stayed and watched it all the way through. Um, sorry, I didn't answer more of your questions. Um, uh, well, quickly, this is a yes or no. Well, Kim mm -hmm. Anderson's uh, Ander Andertons, uh, it's below, uh, ever carry Strandberg guitars? <laughs> if all Andertons did was stock guitars that I liked, no, <laughs> basically. Uh, as I'm afraid, as soon as you cut the headstock off a guitar, it no, it ceases to look like a guitar and looks like a kitchen utensil. Um, <laughs> but uh, but given that lots of guitar players do seem to like it, and Andertons absolutely should be there about stocking products that its customer wants and not just what I want, then yes, absolutely, one day I'm sure, whether it's Strandberg or Kiesel or Ormsby or... or whatever brand of cool uh, modern guitar comes along, we should look at. Uh, but I'm afraid to say it leaves me completely cold. <laughs> <It's just laughs> and, and, you got, and there's one other big problem. How do you hang them? Well, yeah, there you go. That's a great, <laughs> yeah, how do you hang them? 
So I don't know. But look, if anybody did put a question in and I didn't answer it and they want to do it, can I just say I do uh, on the Captain Anderton Facebook page, I do try my absolute hardest to answer every question that goes on there. So please just ping it through there and, and I'll do my best to catch up with you uh, later in the week. That would be great. I was going to say if, if there were any other places people wanted to reach out to you. So Facebook and um, yeah, Captain Anderton Facebook page or uh, obviously YouTube. Um, although in fairness, YouTube is probably not the best place to ask a question that you want me to answer because there's just too many people doing that. So the Facebook one is, is better. OK, well, thanks so uh, much for joining us. All right. Uh, thanks, I, guys. Yeah, that was awesome. So hang on real quickly as I hang yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for watching. We have like 200 viewers still. So wow, that's great. That's Thanks everyone. That's maybe, cool. Maybe. And look, I look forward to seeing. Will I get to meet you at uh, Nam Show, maybe, Mark, or if you're there in, in January? Or? I will be there in January, definitely. Okay. Well, I'd love to come and say hello. And Dave, I said if I don't see you before, I shall see you then. Have yeah. lovely days. And this is me signing out. See you later. See ya. Take care.